Hi, everybody. I'm Ellen Bristol. I'm going to be your presenter this morning. And let's just give ourselves a few more minutes as participants are logging in as we speak. And I'm just picking up a few more pages from my <laughs> printer. <laughs> you think I'd have taken care of this ahead of time. Our host today, the Miami Foundation, Stephanie Cruz, is unfortunately in a situation where she can't join us verbally. So I'm going to take it all. Oh, I see an old friend of mine is registered. Pascal, what a pleasure. So Give us just another second. Lots of folks logging in. And thank you for, um, uh, Gwendolyn says, uh, looking forward to this critical topic. That always sounds good to me. I think it's a really critical topic as well. Okay, just one more moment. I'll introduce myself. And I just want you to know, um, as I said earlier, usually our friends from the Miami Foundation, in particular Stephanie Cruz, would be able to moderate and we could hear her. She is moderating and she's our tech support. So if you have technical questions, please post them. You'll only be able to post to me or to Steph. Um, she, she can't be online, to, uh, I mean, she's online, but she can't be on audio. Complicated, who needs to know? So everyone, let's get started. I'm Ellen Bristol. I am the founder of Bristol Strategy, um, a fundraising consultancy I launched in Miami back in 1995 um, after a long career in the for-profit industry. So I, uh, it makes me stand out a little bit from a lot of folks in, um, who are consultants to nonprofits is that the majority of my uh, experience comes from the for-profit sector before I opened this consulting practice. But shortly after I opened it, I started to work with nonprofits and I fell in love with you guys. So I hope that what we have to talk about here is going to have a positive beneficial impact on what you guys are doing or attempting to do in your nonprofits today. Please hold your questions to the end. We're gonna try and uh, time this so we have a good 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. Post your questions to me in chat. So let's get started here by talking about why we need to fundraise smarter. Full disclosure, the methodology we designed is called fundraising the smart way, and it's all about a strategic approach. So we've been needing to fundraise smarter for a really long time. By the way, if, if the thumbnail of my face interferes, you guys know you can just put your cursor on it and drag it around so you can see what's on the screen. So why do we need to fundraise smarter? And by the way, we've been needing to do this as long as I've been in, in the business. Well, for one thing, this is, has nothing to do with the co current COVID pandemic. The last two or three years, senior development officers, highly experienced professionals at raising money have been re either retiring because they're old fogies or just leaving the sector. 
traditional donors are dying out. Traditional is the name of the age cohort before the baby boomers. Well, the baby boomers themselves are in their early to mid 70s. So the traditionals, folks who were alive during World War II, are in their late 70s, their 80s, their 90s. And guess what, folks? They're not leaving all their money to you. Donor retention rates have averaged under 40% as long as we've been measuring donor retention rates. This goes back to about 2006. That's really terrible because it means that every year, nonprofits have to replace 60% of their donors and donations just to stay even. The overhead myth persists. Uh, those of us who spend all our lives uh, thinking about and working with fundraisers know that the overhead myth is ridiculous. It doesn't, it's not an effective measurement of uh, the nonprofit's ability to achieve impact. Yet many nonprofits foundation, uh, many nonprofit professionals continue to believe they're hampered by it. Some foundations still kind of buy in and some philanthropists still kind of buy in. But you know what? Some years you have to spend money on so-called overhead, staff, technology, facilities, fixing the roof. Some other problems. There's been a trend over the last three to four years before COVID hit toward losing smaller donors. So we're seeing a kind of more huge, gigantic, dominating gifts largely going to large, very well-funded organizations. And teeny tiny, daily, you know, $25 a year, $50 a year gifts, and everything in the middle, we've been seeing a decline. And yet at the same time, ongoing growth of social needs. And then, kaboom, what do we get? we get the COVID pandemic. And along with the COVID pandemic, we've gotten huge economic disruptions, uh, loss of jobs and livelihoods, um, and the very clear revelation of very dangerous racial and social uh, injustices and inequities that we should have been fighting long ago. So the first thing I want to tell you folks is don't panic. By now we should be past our initial panic anyway, but I know personally there's a different kind of panic that sits in when the crisis is six months old, seven months old, and we really don't know when things are going to improve substantially. So there are five recommendations here. First is to slow down and revisit your fundraising strategy because solid strategy beats frenzied tactics every time. Refocus yourself on knowing your ideal donor profile and revising your messaging and exploring every channel for outreach available to you. Most important, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, you have to take a break. You have to give your, yourselves some rest. I'm a workaholic and I understand this very, very deeply. When you're in a panic and when things are scary and when your clients and the, 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 the individuals you serve are in distress, somehow we feel obligated to sacrifice our own personal lives and our health. But you can't do anybody any good if you're constantly exhausted and stressed out because guess what? It takes twice as long to get half as much done 
and you make more mistakes. I'm watching you take a nap. Now, if you recall, I told you that I got my start in business, in uh, corporate business to business sales for two different companies in the Fortune 50 level. And what I discovered was really what motivated me to, to start developing the methodology fundraising the smart way. And that is that there are disciplines we can anticipate in highly successful sales teams that tend to be largely lacking in the nonprofit sector. So here are a few key lessons we can learn from how successful sales teams respond to crisis. Now, notice I'm just saying crisis. Right now, everybody's, you know, like this, beaten down by the COVID pandemic. But it's not so long ago that we had the great housing boom and bust cycle followed by the Great Recession. It's not so long ago, in fact, it's going on now that nonprofits in California had to figure out how to deal with devastating fires. That down here in Florida, we had to cope with hurricane, whatever it was, I can't even keep track of them anymore. Um, so you never know when another crisis is gonna come along, which is why highly successful sales teams have strategies for managing crisis and there are highly strategic approaches. For one thing, they document performance expectations. We're gonna be talking about that a bit more. They document expectations that they have when things aren't in crisis and then they can adjust based on the crisis but people still know what they need to do. They analyze performance to improve productivity. They, salespeople and management and senior leadership often will scrutinize data about how they generate revenue in order to improve their productivity so that they know something is going to come in even if things are difficult. Wherever and whenever, they implement supportive technology that helps to automate repetitive tasks and reduce costs so that the cost of raising your next gift or grant becomes lower. And finally, the management team and the leadership team and just generally everybody, because in small nonprofits, we're all playing all of those roles, they provide coaching support to help folks maintain their morale and their engagement. So yeah, I know <laughs> I'm presenting to nonprofits and many of you are probably saying, don't biz plane me, tell me how nonprofits cope. Uh, one of the things we've done at Bristol Strategy Group is run a capacity assessment called the Leaky Bucket Fundraising Assessment. The Leaky Bucket Assessment, the formal name is the Leaky Bucket Assessment for Effective Fundraising, is the only major popular study of what goes on in the fundraising shop. There are other really important studies that you guys should familiarize yourselves with. One is the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. You can get all the data you want from that by visiting the Association for Fundraising Professionals website. Um, and the other is the report published by Giving USA every year. You have to spend a couple hundred dollars on that. Our leaky bucket assessment only looks at ways your organization is equipped to provide the capacity and productivity you need in your fundraising team, whether that team includes fundraising professionals, any staff, or just volunteers. So let me give you a quick update on how well we're doing, or maybe I should say how well we're not doing. These are some of the problems that have dogged our heels 
uh, we've been running this research for 10 years. And although we have lots more respondents, the percentages haven't changed very much. One of the most important elements is to have ideal donor or funder profiles. You need an ideal grant maker profile. You need an ideal corporate sponsor profile. You need an ideal donor profile. Because when you have those profiles, you don't waste time on people who don't match. Yet only 16% of our 1500 respondents to date have documented profiles that include motivations for giving. We all know just because people have money doesn't mean they're gonna give it to you. Only 18% of our respondents had specific performance targets for acquiring new donors. A performance target says, this year we need to acquire 100, 100 new donors or X percent of new funding sources. Donor retention is one of the biggest problems we have, yet only 12% of nonprofits tell their fundraising teams we need to retain Y percent. If we did that, we'd be raising, we'd be keeping 50%, 60%, 100% more money than we do, do when we don't retain our donors. Upgrading funders is a really important strategy. If they're already committed to you at the $100 level, what do we need to do to get them to commit to you at the $150 level or the $200 level or the $100 a month level? Well, only 18% of you establish some targets. Only 19% have well-balanced uh, funding diversification. That means you don't put all your eggs in one basket. basket. Only 26% dedicate enough staffing resources. So those are the first six reasons why stuff is problematic. A seventh practice that's essential is how you measure performance. In our leaky bucket assessment, we mention two kinds of performance measures that are called trailing indicators. Trailing indicators are stuff like how much money actually came in the door. By the time you uh, count the money up, it's too late to correct course. It's too late to figure out that you wasted money, that you uh, took too long to get the gift, or that you left money on the table, and so on. Up to 65% of our um, uh, uh, respondents only use trailing indicators. Leading indicators are things you need to do at the beginning and the middle of the so-called cultivation process, like figuring out if you're eligible for certain grants, writing letters of intent, uh, trying to get yourself introduced to donors who are interested in the kind of work you do and so on, only 15% of our respondents used any leading indicators and 12%, which isn't small, use no measures at all. The fundraising toolkit is an incredibly important element. Having a toolkit means having a strategic plan, having ideal donor profiles, having some kind of donor management software, at least a spreadsheet, and having a formal case for support. But as you see in this arena also, less than half of our respondents had a strategic plan at all, much less one with fundraising goals and metrics. And between you and me, some of us think that 48% are lying. Um, a, a, just over a quarter claim to have funder prospect profiles. Just over half had some way to manage their donors and other funders. And less than a quarter had an up-to-date case for support. So I hope you're not all throwing yourself off a bridge yet. But here's the last and to my way of thinking, 
the single most critical of all of these practices. And that is the question, how does your nonprofit react when fundraising results are below desired levels? Do you fire the development director? Do you throw more events? Or do you write grant applications by the pound and hope something sticks? We got more answers in those categories than anything else. About half of our respondents throw more fundraising events, good luck doing that in COVID days, or write more grants for no purpose. Well, folks, those are not very useful techniques. What's far more useful are crafting or improving your ideal donor profiles, training your staff, board, and volunteers. And in a crisis, I think you should be reaching out to more volunteers. I'm speaking specifically here about prospective fundraising volunteers. More about that to come. And finally, update your messaging and increase your outreach. It is not a bad idea to, to send out messages that say, listen, the current pandemic has made the problem more acute, but the fact is we need to raise money to solve this social program, put more people in affordable housing, make sure more youngsters coming out of foster care, have transitional support, and so on, and so on. It's important to do that. People need to hear it from you. And if they can't help you with a check, maybe they can help you by going and rattling the cage of their social network. So where do we start to fix these things? I got five steps for you here. And we're going to look at each one of them separately. You might start thinking about flexing your mission. Um, the way at my company we define the stages of a strategic plan is that vision comes first and it describes how the world's going to be different 10 years, 20 years from now because of you. Mission is what you do now and over the next few years to get closer to achieving your vision. So what was your mission pre-crisis and how do we morph it a little bit during a crisis? Now you're not gonna morph your mission if the crisis is that Bell South drove a backhoe over the internet and your whole neighborhood is out of whack for two days. You don't have to shift your mission for that. But for a long-term crisis, like the Great Recession or the COVID pandemic, it's worth it to think about flexing your mission. I'm gonna give an example of the actual mission state statement, excuse me, of Habitat for Humanity. Until I read this, I wasn't really aware, even though we've worked with a few Habitat affiliates, that Habitat was a faith-based organization. Don't yell at me if you're from a Habitat affiliate. I love you guys. So they didn't really have to morph their mission, but a client of ours who is a Habitat affiliate, not here in Florida, their morph was to say, by acting now, we ease the plight of our neighbors who sacrifice medical care just to keep a roof over their heads. Think about how this concept might impact or, or might give you an opportunity in your, um, in your organization to morph just a little bit so that it appeals more urgently to prospective funders. Now let's talk uh, in case I haven't bored you to death with the notion of the ideal donor or ideal funder profile and why you need one. Your time is too expensive to waste, especially now. 
Many of you who provide direct service to clients can divide your group into essential workers, those who are providing direct service to clients and wearing lots of PPE, and those who are working out of their homes to do admin and bookkeeping and record keeping and fundraising. In either case, whether you're an essential COVID term or non-essential COVID term, your time is too expensive to waste on donors who don't match your ideal profile because you'll end up trying to browbeat people who either don't care, aren't interested, don't have capacity, or all three. Don't do it. Qualified prospective funders, be they individual donors, grant-making organizations, including government, or corporate sponsors, those who are qualified by having the right motivations to support you and capacity will give to you more, more often with less hassle and the, the cycle to win the gift is likely to be shorter. When you craft an ideal donor profile, giving motivations are more important than giving capacity. Hold on. So who's your ideal donor? I'm just talking here about the giving motivations. It's relatively easy to discover what their giving capacity is. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. So some of the questions to ask are these. Amongst your current uh, individual donors, if you have any, or other kinds of funders, how strong is their passion for what you're doing in your organization? Do they have a track record of giving either to you or to other organizations like yours, preferably both? How easy is it to engage them? If it's very difficult, that's a question mark. Has their, does their life experience for individual donors in particular have some relevance to the cause you support? If it's affordable housing, re-entry after prison, aging out of foster care, uh, dealing with a, 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 a disorder or disease, have they or has somebody in their amongst their friends or family had experience with this? Do they have a track record of volunteering, of giving board service, of other forms of social activism? Most important, look at funders you currently have and ask yourself, is this funder someone I'd like to clone? What are their criteria? What are their characteristics? How do they interact with you? Is it a pleasure? because those are your ideal donors. Um, by the way, I have given you in the resource page, a link to our uh, library of resources. All of them are free and there are a number of white papers on this very subject, including one that I really urge you to get called Three Simple Questions That Get Donors to Give. Now, here's an important thing about having an ideal donor profile. It kind of gives you and the other members of your fundraising team the courage to say no. You don't have to keep trying to get blood from a turnip. If the prospective funder isn't crazy or doesn't support your cause or your missions or values, or they're more hassle to deal with than they're worth. They're constantly telling you what you're doing wrong. If they dangle gifts that pull you off mission, or if there are so many strings attached, say no. Don't be afraid to say no 
when funders approach you who really aren't going, uh, other than their dollars, they're going to be doing things that are against your ethics, your values, or your purpose. I can't stress them enough. Now, a third thing I want to encourage is the establishment of performance targets, performance expectations. Um, there's been a lot of study about this, and the discovery has been that when people know what's expected of them at work, they do a better job, whatever the work is, whatever the expectation is. So in the fundraising arena, I want you to think about this first. How many of your donors, all funding sources in your case, who gave to you this year, last year, or the year before, can you retain to give again? I don't care if they give this year or if they give in 21. But there, there's also some discovery that the best time to ask for a gift is shortly after someone gave you a gift. So take a look at your list of funding sources and ask yourself, who on this list didn't give to me in 20, but gave to me in 2019 or 2018? What would I have to do to pull them back in? We had the unhappy experience of doing an analysis for a client recently only to discover they were retaining 2% of their donors. That meant, and, and they managed to keep on bringing in the same amount of money, P.S. it wasn't much, but they had to replace 98% of their donors every year. So sit down and say, if I have 100 donors, I don't care if you have 10 donors, but we had 12 donors last year, how many of the 10 can I retain? And can I pick up those two that didn't give last year? Set a target and check your work, so to speak, every month or two to see how many you're re-engaging with and getting another gift from. Do the same thing with acquisition of new funding sources. Many of you, because I understand from uh, my friends at the foundation, at Miami Foundation, many of you are small organizations. I suspect many of you get that your primary income from grants. Many grant makers will restrict the number of years that they can give. So are you starting now one year into a three-year grant to figure out how to ensure you keep them for the three years and who to replace them with. Start your replacement strategy immediately with new funders and, and start looking for donors. And of those who currently give to you, how many of them can you upgrade to the next level of giving? These are simple things to start with. And it's really surprising how motivating it is when you sit down board and staff together, board staff and volunteers together and say, you know, from here on out, we're aiming to retain 50% of our donors or 60% of our donors. God forbid, aim for 90%. It's possible. Rare, but possible. Now let's talk about reviewing your work. Um, there are a million reports you can write. I don't want to make you crazy with suggesting reporting tools. So just keep track of a pipeline spreadsheet, or if you're using uh, Bloomerang or DonorPerfect or any of the um, relatively low-end nonprofit CRMs, uh, if you email me, ellen at bristolstrategygroup.com, I can give you some additional suggestions that are low cost and even no cost. But take a look at 
how you're performing against those three targets, actual retention, actual acquisition, actual upgrade compared to target. And I like to look at reports because they give me a chance to read the story the numbers are telling. So if we're seeing that our retention rate is improving, ask yourself, okay, what did we do to improve our retention rate? Oh, brilliant, we sent emails and made phone calls to current donors. If they're undesirable, you're not getting desirable results, try another tactic. That's all, just try something else and see if that works. I like, let me just give you a very, very brief introduction to the concept of performance indicators often referred to as KPIs. I said earlier that what the performance we're seeing uh, in, in the way people measure nonprofit fundraising performance is that there is a heavy emphasis on looking at the trailing indicators. So trailing indicators, those are at the bottom of my uh, slide here, are the donor made the gift. Well, we all wanna jump up and down and turn back flips because that's great. And then the donor gave us a testimonial, equally great. But it took so long to get there. So the leading indicators turn out to be far more, I'm not gonna say important. I'm gonna use a term from statistics. They're diagnostic. Leading indicators tell you more about the health of your fundraising process than trailing indicators do. So are the funders I'm talking to qualified? I mean, are they good enough for us to continue pouring time and money and talent, soft money, into acquiring them? Have they indicated their interest in us? Are they willing to consider and ask from us? Not are they willing to give us money, but are they willing to consider giving us money? We like to break up the arc of cultivation in a somewhat unconventional manner by looking at the way our funders behave rather than we look looking at the way our development team behaves. So our leading in, see we have an eight step model here. Our leading indicators are moves one through four. And there are answers to questions. Move one, the question is, did the prospective funder tell us enough about themselves for us to decide that their motivations for giving match our ideal donor profile? Do they share their reasons for giving? Move two, did they ask us questions about how what we do and how we do what we do and tell us that they liked it? They see the value of our nonprofit. In move three, we actually get to say to them, so what do you think? Buddy, considering what we've just discussed, would you be willing to consider making a gift? And in move four, making a gift, making an investment, providing us with a grant, underwriting a program, paying for a building, whatever it is. Um, and then were they willing to sit down and review the terms and scope of our application or investment proposal. Guess which is the most important one? I'll tell you. It's this, move number one. Do their reasons to give align with what's really gonna work for you? Because if they like what you're doing, the likelihood of them saying yes is very high. Moves five through eight are trailing indicators. If they got all the way to move four, they're probably gonna say yes. The likelihood is very high. They may negotiate the terms or the scope, but they're more very likely to say yes. Then in order to ensure 
you're retaining them, you come back in a f 90 days later and say, we promised we'd stay in touch. We promised we'd get back to you. Are you happy being one of our investors, supporters, sponsors, donors, whatever term you want to use? Then we get them to give some more money and refer us to other people. So think about the fact that if you know enough about the prospective funder in move one and move two, and they're not right for you, they're not enthusiastic, they don't have much capacity, they're unmoved by your uh, mission or cause or programs, or they're ultra overcommitted elsewhere, don't beat a dead horse. Move on to someone or some other entity. Excuse me, I just goofed. All right. Now, at the risk of scaring the pants off you, you really want to pay attention to your leading indicators because it's always a three to one ratio. If you have 90 qualified prospects, 30 will ask for proposals and 10 to 20 will contribute. They'll invest in you. Now, you may think I'm nuts if you're a small organization for asking you, begging you, recommending, pleading with you to consider investing in technology. One of the reasons tech is becoming so important in the nonprofit sector is because, first of all, it's ubiquitous. Second of all, the younger people in this sector are digital natives. They can't imagine not having access to the technology. But Something that's very important for smaller nonprofits is that automation can do so much to expand the capacity of your small team. I, I'm aware of one direct marketing product that can improve that can improve. Uh, income from uh, direct appeal campaigns like annual fund campaigns by as much as 30 to 50 percent for the cost of four thousand dollars a year you couldn't find an employee for four thousand dollars a year so the and and virtually every one of the types of technology on listing here is available at low cost. If, you, um, if you're not paying attention to your website, please find a priority. Hire somebody's 14-year-old nephew. Use a really common platform like WordPress, which is free and, and is a great CMS, content management system. Please make sure that your website is easy enough for your team to use without constantly having to go out to a specialist to make simple updates. Um, remember that 80% of all searches for any kind of information start with a visit to your website. So you need to update it regularly, go heavy on pictures and light on text, and real important, put a lot of forms in your website, forms that you can point to from social media and e-marketing, e I'll mention those in a second, because you wanna be pushing people to your website and capturing their contact information when they get there. That makes it easier for you to turn around and say, I see you joeblow at gmail.com, downloaded our white paper on. Okay, CRMs. There are literally hundreds of CRMs out there. 
a great place to look for CRMs is not to go on nonprofit happy hour and ask what's the best. Rather, go to an organization called N10NTEN.org or Captera, which is a uh, kind of like consumer reports for technology. But CRMs are available at many different prices, and they are so effective, even if all of your funding comes from grants. For digital marketing, you can get massive outreach at a very low cost. And let's not forget, grandma and even great grandma is on Facebook now. Um, you know, my granddaughter thinks Facebook is uh, an antique product, but Facebook and LinkedIn are where donors and business people hang out. Snapchat and TikTok are where youngsters hang out. Let's see, who has money? Then there's prospect research services. These are excellent tools if you want to get to know more about your individual donors and find out if they have the tr track record, giving history and wealth capacity to give you more money. Some of them even provide marketing lists that you can you can really refine those marketing lists um uh, uh, pardon me but my favorite is donor search and donor search makes itself available to small nonprofits through resellers lots and lots of uh, fundraising consultancies resell donor search at a very very low cost so that gives you something to start with in terms of the technology that I'm eager to see you invest in. Again, every one of you who's on this call, please feel free to email me, ellen at bristolstrategygroup.com with additional questions. And I'm happy to schedule a, a complimentary phone calls with you as well. So let's open this for questions. Now, somebody has to ask. A question we often get is, how do I figure out which donors are best for me? So I'm gonna start with that. And there's lots of ways, uh, I'm hoping you have additional questions because we've got a nice 10 minutes to, uh, to explore this stuff. Um, after you design your ideal donor profile, let's put it this way, it can be very simple. You can do it in an elaborate way that requires lots of research. Or you can just wing it from what you think works and then refine it later. I'm going to take an example from a client of ours that works with um, young people who are, have kind of lost their way. They're, they're too old to be um, supported by organizations getting money from, uh, from Children's Trust, but they're not, um, they're not employable. Ah, oh, uh, let me, let me answer, um, uh, let me answer a really great question. Actually, there are three of them that I missed. Okay, the resource page is on the next page. I'll flash over it over to it. And I want you to get in touch with the Miami Foundation because I've given them a PDF of this entire presentation. Um, and uh, the links are all live. Uh, Gwen said, with all of the crazy election donation requests, is it better to allow this time to last or create more authentic 
personal approaches. I, for one, have gotten so many election donation requests that as soon as I see one come up, it goes into the trash basket. But I'm much more responsive to communiques from the organizations I support. I think a lot of us feel that way. And thank goodness, we only have to put up with this nonsense for another month, but you can't afford a month where you're not seeking funding. So many nonprofits have social presence, but they don't ask for money on those social media. It's time for you to start saying, our job at my favorite phony nonprofit at the Institute for the Bewildered is to help people deal with the condition of being bewildered and find ways to reduce it. And those needs have not declined during this pandemic. Please follow this link to our website, blah, blah. And it's on your website that you have an, uh, you know, a testimonial from a bewildered person or a client you've helped and an ask. We can help more people like Ellen who suffers from bewilderment with a modest donation of only. Um, your online giving page has to say, give us between, you know, give us at these levels rather than just give us a donation. So make it personal by personalizing those you've already helped. Um, that's a great way to do it. Uh, Pascal asks a great question here. Is it a good idea if you have a past donor to ask them for other donor suggestions? Actually, that is a great idea. Somebody who's giving to my favorite organization, the Institute for the Bewildered, probably has other like-minded friends. You can ask those, the, the current donors, can you spread the word to your personal network? Or you can call them up and you can say, oh, thank you, your support means so much. Kisses and hugs, lovey, lovey. Do you know anyone else who might be interested in getting involved with our organization? Those are great things to do. Uh, this is a really interesting question. Um, Andra asked it, are there suggested software programs for creating donor database? I'm going to assume I know what you're asking and answer it. And if I haven't answered it, send me another chat. Any CRM creates your donor database. The term CRM stands for Constituent Relationship Management. And the implication is that it is a CRM database. If you have a contact manager on your computer, just as simple as Outlook, where you keep your contacts, that's a database. So um, tools like, what are some of the best ones, best known ones? Donor Perfect, Bloomerang, uh, Virtuous, Neon. Um, there, there, are, there are several hundred of these products. Some of them are extremely inexpensive. And there are other databases that aren't specific to the nonprofit sector. Pipe Drive costs 10 bucks a month. Um, now, some of you may discover so Andra, first send me a note to let me know if I answered that your question. A donor database captures the following information for you. The contact info, their name, middle name, last name, suffix, 
preferred prefix, Mr., Ms., Mrs., Mrs., Miss, Doctor, Professor, Ingeniero, whatever. Um, they also can tell you um, a whole lot of other stuff. They can tell you who referred them to you. They can tell you, the, the database can tell you what form they filled out to get on your database. They can tell you, the database, whether or not they receive your e-newsletters. So you can use Constant Contact or MailChimp for your e-newsletters. So I hope I'm making myself clear. One of the great things about having a donor database as opposed to just a contact list is that you can, re you can find out so much about people. Um, I, I, I'm backed up a little. I love these questions. How often should we send out blast emails? Don't inundate people with the same kind of mechanism. An e-newsletter, some organizations have two, one that's just for current donors and one that's for the universe as a whole. I would vary new, a newsletter a month, a non-newslettery style of e-blast. Everyone, there's an issue we need to cope with now, or we're having a webinar with an expert in our field or something like that. And you can't post on social media too often. Uh, Judith asks, is there an outline available to identify the ideal donor? Um, I have several white papers that help you. Most ideal donors are highly unique, but you know what? Thanks for asking this question because I'm going to formulate a new one, a new step-by-step -step how to build your ideal uh, donor profile. And make sure that our friends at the Miami Foundation know about it because I won't get it done today. Um, the resource page is available on the PDF of this um, deck. And I want you to get that, or I wanna ask uh, Stephanie to please make sure that she sends out the PDF to everybody. Um, Gwen, I love your reaction here. Um, keeping in touch with your donors, I think, you have to get in the habit of being in touch with your donors at least twice a year. An end of year report is dandy. A receipt is a le for a donation is a legal requirement. But what we, in our work, we often um, interview or get our clients to interview a representative sample of their donors. And invariably they come back to us and say, holy moly's, how come nobody asked me these questions before? So keep in touch with your donors regularly. One thing you can do, it's called stewardship folks, is get your board members to call and say, thanks, for supporting us. Tell me about yourself. Those two questions will lead to a nice conversation. I want to, oh my God, so many questions. Uh, somebody asked a question about getting parents in our school to give in Miami. I'm not a big fan of challenges, although there are some great tools for, um, you know, there's Giving Tuesday, there's Give Miami Day, and then there's there's a, 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 a an online giving program called Charity, C-H-A-R-I-D-Y, that lets you do that challenge thing. But Elisa, you have, to, uh, Elsa, I'm sorry, you have to go out and find your pillar donors 
you know, five people who are going to give you $5,000 a pop. And then you got a, a, a challenge to them of $25,000. But, but there are plenty of other ways to do this. Read every book you can possibly find on fundraising. Um, and uh, the Miami Foundation has said, we can upload the PDF to givemiamiday.org slash key dates. That will be great. And I'll make sure that um, um, you have the new outline I'm going to write about, write about uh, creating an ideal donor profile. So we ran over for two minutes, and yet so many of you are still here. I'm thrilled to death. Thank you ever so much. And oh, how to host, how to generate money without doing, vir other than doing vir virtual fundraisers. I want to answer this. Don't do a, con don't do a fundraiser, do an educational conference. Bring in one or two third party experts and clients and hold a series of, you know, two or three it's like going to a conference and hearing from a keynote speaker and two breakout speakers. Charge money to attend that. Your speakers are going to speak for nothing. There are no other costs associated other than the cost of your online presence. So again, thank you for staying over. Let me pull up my resource page because you're still asking for it. Here it is. I love doing these programs. I wish you all the best success in the world. Here's the Smart Practices Resource Library, some books I've, we've written, and go forth and prosper, everyone. Did my mind, oh, Judith. I see someone raised her hand, but I think you've got to uh, do give a chat, unless that was just to say this has been cool. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's been cool. Everybody, it's been my pleasure. Take care. Stay safe. Make a lot of money. <laughs>